I think that's the story of my solitude and my solitude is the story of my faith because there's two ways to look at it. You say loneliness can be the heart of where all religious expression comes from or you can say that it is the basis whereby you become engaged with God. God is it's just everywhere and yet it is within and it is in silence that you experience God. And that's about it. It's, you know, silence that says the language of God. And this is Good Friday, so it's probably a really good day to talk about God or the absence of God, the emptiness of the world without God, which is also what Good Friday is about. And the way I was going to go into this was I have a reflection or a memory, rather, from way back in 2011, that's about 12 years ago. And I'll share that with you, and then that'll lead me on to a few meditations and reflections on the whole thing of Good Friday. Let let me start by uh, sharing this with you. And as I say, it's from about 11 years or 12 years ago. When I'm travelling with a theatre show, I stay in different hotels. I move about the country like a shadow. I imagine my jeep is a ghost gliding through the 19th century and that the horses in the fields are standing in a long ago time. I imagine that on the wide streets of old towns like Caer and Kilmallock, people of the 1800s are still standing around and that they can see me moving through their world, driving my ghostly stagecoach without horses. And I love the anonymity of hotels. They're places where I can be both close to other people and yet utterly aloof. Like a bewildered cleric pacing the cloister, I pace the hotel foyer, and I'm close to other people without being intimate. Although the clerics I knew usually had more time for golf courses than for monasteries. Overactive and forever on the go, their cars were always full of camogie players. They needed others around them all the time, which is a sign of great loneliness. Even the general likes to say that the loneliest place to be is in a crowd, or in the arms of a person one no longer loves. The Irish clergy were a paradox, lonely yet gregarious, living in the fishbowl world of the parochial house where anyone could walk into their private space and take a piece of it. I had a distant cousin who was a priest in Nigeria. He used to arrive without warning from the airport in a Volkswagen and buzz around the drumlands, visiting old friends and relations. My mother used to cook him dozens of rashers and puddings in the middle of the day because, she said, he was half-starved in Africa, and over the years he brought her an enormous amount of handbags made from crocodile skin. He had a red face, which I presumed was from too much sun, and sometimes the crimson flesh appeared to be on the verge of seeping blood. I always suspected that he had health problems, so I wasn't surprised when he finally arrived home one November with cancer and died quietly in a nursing home in Wicklow. He never boasted about his work in Africa, or tried to gather up the narrative of his deeds and make them heroic. In fact, he never said anything about his work in Africa at all. If he came in summer time, he would idle about with his country cousins, winning hay or footing turf, and if he came in winter, he would just sit by the fire for a few weeks his red face dripping beads of sweat as he sat, and I'd ask him what was life like in the bush, because that's what Cavan people called Africa in those days. 
he'd say, Africans are lovely people. That's all. Lovely people. Sometimes he'd show us photographs of himself with a cluster of women sitting at a well or perhaps standing outside a school with a gang of little boys. I remember seeing him one morning in the Volkswagen outside our house. He had slept in it all night because he didn't want to wake us. And when I opened the curtains, he was praying from his bravery, and there was something serene and calm in his eyes that I envied. He was like a ghost in my world, and he was enveloped in a solitude I have sought for ever since. In hotels I wrap myself in solitude as I stand in the lift, or sauna, or lounge bar. It's as if at last I'm a ghost in the world of others. At night I hear people orgasming in distant rooms, just as a dying person might hear children playing outside the window. But I'm not lonely. It's just that I have given up on life for a moment, and solitude is nothing more nor less than the realization that one's day, or even one's life, has been uneventful and not worth holding on to. Solitude is sitting in the sauna with equanimity, and without desire, no matter who is sitting on the other bench. Solitude is being at home in the poverty of one's own bones. So a good hotel is about the only degree of intimacy I can bear, especially after being on stage all evening in the theatre, to know that there is love out there beyond the wall. That's enough. And to know that where I sleep, I am safe from harm. I don't think it's it's something I'm ashamed of when I say I experience loneliness. I'm lonely now. Maybe you're lonely. But loneliness is not, for me, it's not an inadequacy. Loneliness is just, it's kind of closing the door on the world and it, it can be a beautiful, wonderful place to be. It's like a mood, it's like a kind of a nostalgia. You know, you you have a melancholy inside in you. It's like, it's like you can feel your longing for other people. And you're aware of your longing for other people. But at the same time, you're letting go of it. And for me, this is Good Friday. Good Friday has, there's a line that Jesus uses on the cross when he says, it's finished, it's complete. I feel that's like closing the door in a very positive way. It's okay sometimes to just let go and relax into the solitude, into the loneliness of just being you. And it's it's also lovely to think about, like, you don't have a problem that you need to solve, you know? All the time in life I feel there's this enigma called me, Michael, and I'm I'm constantly trying to solve it. When I when I write or when I do work or when I get a job or when I do a show or when I'm touring, everything is about trying to solve this enigma. When I eat I try to eat well. When I drink I try to drink less. When I you know, everything is always trying to push forward this problem towards a solution the problem of me. And there's a way where you're not a problem and recognizing that there's no problematic thing about you. You're just here. It's it's a letting go of other people and it's a letting go of the whole world. You know, it's almost like letting go of your life. And that's again where I think I hear Jesus and 
in the crucifixion, he finally says, it's finished. It's like, it's like letting go. You hear people like children outside the window, and it's okay. You don't want to belong to them anymore. You love them, but you're letting go. You're, you're in your own space. And that's where you're going to fall into this big abyss of silence that we all have we're all afraid of, and yet it's there every day. And if you take a minute to go in there every day, you will realize that you are falling into prayer. And that's the beauty of Good Friday. So I suppose if I have if one thing that I feel important in my heart today on Good Friday, it is the way that this day can lead you into silence, it can lead you into letting go, it can lead you into kind of even letting go of life. Just just be still and let everything go and you'll find that a new space opens up, there's a silence opens up, silence is the language of God, opens up and you hear a new conversation. If you just be still one of the Psalms says, like, be still and know that I am God. Be still. And somewhere else it says, speak, Lord, your servant servant is listening. It doesn't say, listen, Lord, your servant is speaking. It says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And that listening, for me, that's today, that's Good Friday. Is that sense of, if you can just let go of your work and your relationships and all the complexity of the life around you. And if you can find 20 minutes or an hour where you say to yourself, there is no problem. Your life is not a problem to be solved. It's a mystery to be experienced. It's, it's not a big question mark. You're not going all the time compulsively to other people to have social interactions which will kind of awaken you and make you clearer as to how you see the world. It's just you being present in this moment. And and that's the letting go that happens for me today in the story of Good Friday. Just that letting go. It's finished. Let go and let God a poster used to say when I was young. Anyway, it's Good Friday and I did a piece on Holy Week and coming up to Easter in the last podcast. What I also want to do is to continue sharing from week to week some of the story in a book called What is Beautiful in the Sky? And so I'm going to pick it up and read from here it's a piece that is about three years ago this this particular month because this is just the time three years ago when the lockdown began and we were all in this estranged world. Now we're looking back on it now and people feel, you know, there was awful damage done during the lockdown. But at the same time, I felt at the time that there was a huge kind of silence opened up in the world, which was really interesting. Anyway, I'll read you this for Good Friday. In the spring of 2020, I went through old hard drives, photographs and letters from the dead, and shivered at the person I had become and the person I was before the virus. It seems like I'm never who I think I am even then or now. The footprints I make on the earth always turn out to be the footprints of a stranger. Sometimes I wake in the morning and my beloved is still asleep. I rise and walk about the house and then around the garden trying to enter another day in lockdown without screaming. I go to the kitchen and check the time. The clock says 6am. 
I sit at the table and accidentally squash my reading glasses under my arse. The day is off to a bad start, and I'm stressed. But I won't let the virus win, I whisper, nor will I allow the lockdown to depress me. With headphones, I listen randomly to stuff in my music library. The Deer's Cry by Arvo Part. John Moriarty talking about how humans got disconnected from the evolving cosmos and went their own way, thus bringing the planet to the sorry impasse of unbridled capitalism, pollution and the confinement we are now enduring. I put coffee in the pot and leave it on the hot ring until the water bursts up at the funnel and I harvest a tidy little cup of tar-like liquid. Sometimes I take this coffee to my studio to meditate or pray. But there are other mornings when my faith doesn't survive the night and being mindful is like trying to hold smoke in a saucer. I am devastated from the moment I wake. I feel like a detective in a book I haven't read, a meaningless speck of an indifferent universe. I'd like to be in harmony with nature. I'm a writer, but I don't burn with zeal, as great writers often do. I'm lazy and uncertain. Even starting the day with a positive attitude can be tricky. I'd like to be as geese are, that fly over me, or like the dolphin is, that slips through the waters shaping her, the force of the sea or the wind carving their beauty across millions of years. But I'm not a dolphin or a goose, just a human overreaching himself with expectations, over-anxious about a tiny virus, and helpless in this newly locked down world. Eventually the only thing I can do is to take some coffee to the beloved. I open the curtains, tell her it's morning, present the hot cup. I return to the sheets, and in the privacy of our home, I hug her. As it happens, I am aware that this hug will become the richest part of the day. It is the portal through which I slip into an interior landscape where all is well and will be well, where dolphins and geese sing in harmony, where Arvo Part and John Moriarty hold hands and dance. The tenderness of a hug is almost perfect, apart from being slightly tarnished by the knowledge that there are many who cannot find a hug anywhere, many who might search every drawer in the house, change all the clothes in the hot press twenty times a day, and paint the fence blue, but not a hug will they get. I know one particular lady in her eighties who lives alone. Her husband is dead, and she misses him, but she also misses life, as it was before the lockdown. She sends me occasional emails, but it's as if she was waving from an island at a passing ship in hope of catching their attention. I stand with indifference on the ship's deck and watch her. Before the lockdown, she went to Mass, received the host from a Eucharistic minister's hand, and sliced many scones to share with her best friend in a coffee shop on the way home. Even in Dunn's stores, she used to bump against other people and feel the touch of the young cashier's fingers as she paid for her groceries, and as the cashier passed the change back into her palm, counting the euros and the twenty-cent pieces sent by tiny cent. A hairdresser would call to her house each week. It wasn't that she needed her hair perfectly shaped in silver-blue locks, but 
the accidental touch of the hairdresser's fingers kneading her scalp made a difference. And there are stories of others who have been forced to endure their final hours on earth with only an iPad to touch, a screen of pixels to run their finger across in tiny acts of tenderness and farewell. One evening I made a shrine for an artist who died. I sat on the patio with candles and black and white images of her, thinking about how we will all cross the same river eventually, and praying that the angels would lead her into paradise. One morning I stood for ages at the window, staring out at the desolate fields and the deserted road. Days regularly passed, like that during lockdown, as I moved about in a private universe, and the beloved beside me moved in hers. Then some accident required we pay each other attention for a moment. "'What are you doing?' the beloved asked. But I couldn't tell. I felt like a dazed rabbit that had been hit by a tractor and just managed to get home to his burrow. "'And why are you wearing that peaked cap in the kitchen?' she wondered. The fact was that my peaked cap had begun to stick to my head. It happens to a man when he turns sixty-five. A mysterious glue of psychic attachment prevents the cap from coming off, even when he's eating his dinner. Some men are stuck to their caps for so long that if they took them off, nobody would recognize them. Take it off, the beloved said one morning, suddenly exasperated. Take what off, I wondered, thinking she might have sex on her mind. But she only meant the cap. In the lockdown, I feel a ruination I never imagined. Deeper than depression or physical burnout. Because this is ontological. And even though I have lost nobody directly to the disease itself, it's strange how anxiety created by the virus overwhelms me and I brood more and more about people long ago, gone to death. Giants of love and wisdom who would have been consoling to speak with on the phone or on a Zoom meeting if they were alive. Of course, the philosopher and poet John O'Donoghue is one of the more obvious giants that was lost far too young, and sometimes when I imagine what it would be like to talk to him in this crisis, I find it hard to believe that he died over a decade ago. A philosopher from West Clare who was eloquent and wise and articulate. I imagine his insights would be an amazing consolation at this time. We were in the seminary together, in the same class, studying theology, and we took a lift to Italy together in a truck in the summer of 1982, a few weeks after we had both been ordained as priests. We went over the top of the Alps, and stopped at an old church near Montchenis, where a caretaker greeted us in the fog and snow and brought us into the ancient monastery. There we saw a splendid altar on which stood two majestic candlesticks. The caretaker said that Napoleon had come across the snowy path on one occasion and rested there, when he returned to Paris, he sent the candlesticks as a gesture of his gratitude. John fingered them with love, and it was the way he touched everything he came in contact with. The flowers of the Boron, the rocky fields of Connemara, and the hearts of all the people he met around the world through his writing. In Milan, we had a few drinks with the truck driver. We bade him farewell 
and then got a train to Venice. We stayed in a monastery where the abbot was an expert on Caravaggio, and the monks put brandy on their ice cream in the refectory every Sunday. Just before his death, in the winter of 2008, John was in New York and he went to a concert in the Lincoln Center where a violinist was playing a Tchaikovsky concerto in D. John had a single seat near the front. He was so close to the young musician that he could feel the intensity in her body as she played. She was so alive in the passionate and creative act of making music that he wept. It was the measure of how intensely John O'Donoghue loved life and how he had continued all his days to be fired by awe and reverence and beauty. He told the story to an interviewer from National Public Radio, but by the time the interview was broadcast the following month, John had been laid to rest in the cold, damp clay of a graveyard in County Clare. His work inspires me, and his presence haunts me beautifully. But there are times in this isolation when it's hard not to imagine how better it would be if he could write this book, or if we could once again saunter across the bridge in Maynooth from the old seminary to the new campus and idle one more afternoon with a few cups of coffee and sing the praises of Tony O'Malley, Kierkegaard and John Moriarty. I remember a good Friday in Maynooth with John and we, we both took off and went to the spa hotel in Lucan where we had big steaks and it wasn't an act of irreverence it was an act of of, of reverence in some sort of counterintuitive way in other words we saw the beauty of fasting we saw the beauty of the whole church in its edifice in its song of praise to God and yet we knew that there was a counterpoint there was a way of living that was uncertain and existential and lacking all confidence in the possibility of divinity. That's the space of loneliness. That's the space of anxiety. And we knew that very well. And we played with it. Played with it in the sense that we could breathe Kierkegaard. We could breathe the uncertainty. And all that, I think, is summed up on Good Friday. Good Friday is the day that you hear Jesus say, My God, why have you abandoned me? And without again going into the details of the crucifixion, like in a sense of, you know, gory torture, it, it's a metaphor for me. It's a way that opens the door in me to the idea of despair, the idea of just existential despair and anxiety. And those feelings are real. I mean, I, I, I know they're real. I feel them. You feel them. There's not a day goes by that we are not completely infested with a sense of anxiety. A sense that maybe life would have no meaning. That, that maybe all the edifice of stuff about church and religion is just all so much guff. And that in some sense, science has freed us in one way, but burdened us in another way because it has burdened us with the, the anxiety of knowing. The anxiety that comes with uncertainty. And all that despair, too, is about what Good Friday is about. 
It's the day of uncertainty. It's the day of anxiety. It's the day of hopelessness. It's the day of despair. And it's a day of allowing those things to have their moment. I suppose in some way the COVID the COVID problem was like that, you know. If I go back to just three short years ago, I was here in this same room. I was looking out at the same beautiful landscape. But it was as if this strange virus had come and it was going to do things that we didn't even imagine. Maybe it would close down the world. Maybe economies in the West would collapse. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know there would ever be a vaccination. Nothing was known. I remember at the time I still had a camper van and I remember driving to the supermarket to get the groceries and I phoned ahead with the list of what I wanted and the guy in the supermarket put it all together in a box and I was there sitting in the driver's seat of the camper van and he came to the side door and put the big box in on the floor with all the groceries and it was like, you think we were moving some sort of, you know, radioactive substance. And we were keeping our distance and he had a mask on and I had a mask on. And I wouldn't dare even go into the shop. When he had the groceries put into the van, the camper van, he went back into the shop. And then I phoned him in the shop and used a credit card to pay the bill. As I say... You'd imagine we were dealing with nuclear radiation or something. And then when I got home with the with the groceries, I used to take off all my clothes in the camper van and then come out and put different clothes on. And I would leave the old clothes in the camper van for 48 hours because, again, like thinking that the virus could have transmitted itself through the air from his clothes to my clothes in the short few seconds that I had been in his company. I was thinking that, well, after 48 hours, whatever whatever virus activity is going on, people seem to know that it only lasted for 48 hours, so that so if something was kind of infected... If you just left it alone for 48 hours, then it would be safe to use it again. And so I used to leave those clothes in the Jeep, strip naked, come out, put other clothes on, and then I would lock the Jeep for two days. And then in two days' time, I used to feel, well, it's safe now. Now, that that was the absurd, crazy remedies I was using, tactics to prevent myself getting COVID. I didn't want to get COVID because I was between operations. I was I was in that period where I wasn't well. So I definitely didn't want to be getting COVID. But the, the, the amount of tactics that were surreal and absurd that we used in the beginning is quite extraordinary to look back on them now. And that was only three years ago. It's like yesterday. And now it seems like it's a hundred years ago. And when I talk of John O'Donoghue, and I think, my goodness, he died in the winter of 2007, 2008. It It was kind of early January of 2008, as far as I remember. And that's 15 years ago. And I think, my goodness, 15 years ago. He would have been a wonderful help in that time, He'd be a wonderful person to have in a Zoom conversation. So, it's the shortness of life hits me, but on Good Friday, what really gets me is the sense of letting go. And, okay, you can you can look at the, the detail of Christ's passion, and the best place to go for me is always Julian of Norwich. Julian of Norwich meditates on the 
physical passion of Jesus in a way that nobody else does. And if you like that sort of detail, then she's wonderful. And she brings you through a meditation of, you know, Jesus as a human being in deep suffering, physical suffering. I also like to think about Good Friday in a less dramatic and less gruesome way. I like to think of it as letting go. I like to think of it as that moment where, number one, it is finished. You know, that that there's some sense of completion. And it is a lovely feeling if if you're working and you just stop and you take a break for a week, or if you have been working for decades and then you're retiring, or if you're working for four or five hours and then you finally decide, I'll close the laptop. That it's always a wonderful feeling to stop. And it's the same with the voices that go on in your head that are always trying to tell you, you should be bettering yourself. You should be improving yourself. You should be, you know, getting on better with other people or something. And there's some way whereby we keep pushing and pushing and pushing our sense of being conscious in the world to improve it. And sometimes, sometimes, there's a door opens. It's the door of letting go of everything. And it's it's a good door to open. And I think it opens on Good Friday. A letting go of everything. No meaning. And that's why I'm not trying to construct any profound meaning about Good Friday today, except to say its meaning is in the letting go of things. When you come to the end of life, you have to let go. And sometimes when somebody is very ill and they're close to death, they need some person that loves them deeply who is able to say it's time to let go of everything. And when you talk of any sort of idea of heaven that exists in Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, it's always... It's always an intense experience of divine love that can only be experienced when you let go of the ego, of the self. When you completely let go. When you stop speaking, the silence becomes the dominant energy. And in the silence, you hear Christ, it is finished. And it's a journey, it's a journey towards that notion of being finished, be completed, that your life is completed, that it's, it, it, it's not that your life is important or beautiful at the level of, you know, the surface. It, it's that if you let go of that, your deeper life will blaze like the sun. And that's what's beautiful. I'll read you just another little piece, if that's okay. Just a wee quick bit to finish off on. Because I don't want to leave it like that. Anyway. John O'Donoghue was never at the Joe Mooney School, a week-long festival of traditional Irish music, song and dance, held in Drumshambo every year in the third week of July. But I think he would have loved it. Barry's tavern packed with fiddles, flutes and a bazooka. The style was furious. Musicians with red faces sweated over their instruments like men at the hay. I recognised one tune as the battering ram. Then I recognised an American woman I'd met before. I said, let's go down the street to Monica's pub, it might be quieter. But it wasn't. Beneath a low ceiling, 
two Ellen Pipers, one accordion player, two concertina players and four fiddlers were clustered in harmony, flailing away at the polkas, and it struck me that when Ellen Pipes dominate a session, the music tends to sound less furious and more medieval. They open out a delicate baroque structure at the core of every tune. The piping in Monica's was like a soundtrack to a European banquet somewhere in the 16th century. In the afternoons, when the morning workshops were over, I would often step inside someone's house and sit at their table and shake their hand or embrace them in the kitchen without any reason apart from the fact that I hadn't seen them since yesterday. Paddy McManus, a publican on High Street and a building contractor who had done renovations on the house I was living in, sat in his armchair in the kitchen on Saturday evening, as contented as a large cat when I stepped in unannounced, while his wife Betty fried a pan of boxty. It was the last evening of the festival. Outside the streets were quiet, and the pubs were swept and sparkling, ready for the final sessions. The world was holding its breath for the sun to set and the night to begin. Forty-nine tutors had given classes in twelve different instruments to hundreds of musicians from across the globe, and each night the pubs hummed with a single language. I thanked Betty for the box day and headed down High Street. The High Street in Drumshambo has an elevated promenade that links the public houses, and humans of every gender, race and age were wandering around with instruments strapped to their backs. People shared chips and beer and sat on the wall. We still have the photographs of you from last year, one tall German man joked with a local. Aye, said the local, so do the guards. A Hungarian man pinned me to the wall, telling me that the Tuha de Danen came to Ireland in a flying ship, but could not land, as the Fomorians had set up an energy field that they could not penetrate. So they had to circle nine times before finding a breach in the energy field. That is why they landed their boats on top of Schlieveneren, he said. Did you know that? Well, it's the first I heard of it, I said, but thanks for telling me. An American lady told me, that she was in a night club in Basel recently, where they had bowls of condoms and ear plugs on the counters. I said, it's an education just listening to a well-travelled woman like you. Are you American? I'm Irish-American, she pointed out. Fair enough, says I. And no doubt you feel like an exile and you long to find a home. I guess we're always looking for home, she replied. And it's true. Every year, they down tools, and every year, they walk away from their desks and tune up their banjos and arrive like old fish at the top of the Shannon, because music offers them a kind of home, a refuge. They're just ordinary people, teachers, painters, plumbers, and sometimes they come from tattered lives where they no longer feel at home. But in this place they can shelter and immerse themselves in a tai chi of jig and reel as their collective psyche shifts into a different zone where they find it. They find home. But I don't play any music, the American said. Neither do I, I replied. But I'm an evangelist for the flute. And I believe reels and jigs have a rhythm as hypnotic and calming as the chanting of Tibetan monks. And music is the real language of all Ireland. Remember that in the big houses of ancient times, Irish may have been spoken in the kitchen, and English in the parlour, but everyone danced to the same tunes. 
I ordered us another drink. The only thing on the counter was a bowl of peanuts. Come back next year and try a workshop, I suggested. You can't imagine the pleasure of spending an entire morning learning a single tune and then playing it all afternoon like a contented child. I used to play the tin whistle, she confessed. Do you think it's too late to find one? Now you're talking, I said. I know a woman down the street who has an entire handbag of them. And on it went, as if forever, smiling and laughing and touching and passing one tin whistle from my lips to her lips and her lips to some stranger's lips, all for the joy of another tune and relishing the expressions of love and seduction in every open face. Forever young and the bars never closed and nobody would have ever imagined us in surgical masks that would wipe the smile of a corpse. Yeah, so so that's the final image I'll give you for Good Friday. You know, that there was a time when all that fun was happening in Drumshambo during the Mooney Summer School every July, and I used to be down there, and we'd have great fun, and it was like that. And mixing... Even even sharing the tin whistle, which I look back on now, it, it's amazing that we were so relaxed, so unconscious of, of, of stuff like that came along with COVID. And when COVID came along, there was no, there was no Mooney School that year. I think for two years. There was no Mooney School and it was like, it seemed like the death of so much, the death of life. If life is social, then what happened in COVID was the death. And I think about it for some strange reason today because it's Good Friday. And because Good Friday three years ago in 2020, I was so connected with this terrible, ominous time that was ahead of us. And yet during that time, I was able to take refuge in Good Friday. I was able to take refuge in the idea of letting go, of saying that, okay, if Jesus is on the cross and he says, my God, why have you abandoned me? If Jesus, who has been the wisdom teacher, the Sufi teacher for, you know, a long period of time and developed a huge following, and there he has been crucified, caught and crucified. I mean, he wouldn't have seen it as a triumph. Nobody would. It was a disaster. I mean, no wonder they scattered. We all talk about, like, oh, how they were all cowards and they scattered after the crucifixion. But, like, they didn't know the full story. They didn't know what was going to happen in the following 2,000 years. All they knew was they're living their life and they have this guy who's a teacher and he just ends badly. That's It's over. It's over. So how did Jesus feel? Guy is getting crucified. And there's a moment where he actually cries out, My God, why have you forsaken me? Rhetorically. There's a level of despair in that. You know, there's a grandeur to that story that makes it a template for all our suffering, all our despair. I think of Bakhmud, a city in Ukraine where there has been horrendous slaughter in the past two or three months and we don't hear about it we still live in a world where we'd prefer the media to censor us so that we don't have to face the full horror of what goes on I think of Auschwitz and the whole extermination of the Jewish people of Europe that went on during the time of the Nazis in Europe you think of these terrible moments of of darkness. You think of Jesus as, as trying to put together a, a beautiful story, a narrative, and, and a, a wonderful hope that maybe there's meaning in all this. Maybe there's meaning. Maybe there's a God who loves us through all this fire of darkness. And there, he, where does he end up? He ends up on a cross being crucified and dying and saying, Oh, my God, you've forsaken me. And that is so 
so dark that, you know, it, it could push you away. But it's also, it's also consoling because, and I have to say this personally, there's nowhere that I have gone in the depths of despair that I didn't feel that I was meeting Christ in that depth. There's no darkness below the surface where I fell into, like from illness or depression or whatever. There's nowhere down there in my psyche where I didn't find Christ. Because in the story, it says, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he went the journey. He walked the walk. He completed it all. And that's a consolation in itself. That's, I suppose, a way that Christian faith consoles me in dark times. And it did so powerfully during COVID lockdowns. It allowed me to actually see what was beautiful in the sky, what was miraculous in the life of swallows, cuckoos and little bumblebees. It allowed me to rejoice even in a time of sadness. And that's all in the fact that Jesus is saying, why have you forsaken me, my God? And then there's a bigger moment comes and it comes after that moment. And it's the moment where he says, it is finished. And I think of that, like when I think of somebody like John O'Donoghue, who died in his sleep, who let go. When I think of so many people who do just let go in that final moment, in that final leaping into faith, leaping into the abyss of non-being and just letting go of all that you have been, all that you've held on to as a human being, all that you've gripped and kept tight as meaningful in your life. You just let go of it. You have to let go of it. And I think of it as the letting go that happens in ordinary life when I am burdened by meaning. I'm burdened by trying to improve my life. I'm burdened by trying to get on with other people. I'm burdened by, oh, just like trying to be me and analyzing who me is endlessly, second after second after second, asking myself all sorts of questions that are sort of poking at who I am. And then comes the day that you say, let go. And that day comes on Good Friday. And it comes with the template of the Christ story, the Jesus story on the cross. It comes with that template to let go. Just let go. Just just let go of who you are. Let go of your all your problems like... You know, I'm this kind of person or that kind of... Just let go of it. And be. I think that opens up a silence. It's more powerful than the ocean. So there you have it. Dear friends. Can I call you friends? I hope so. And it's it's a joy to me to share these moments. This one has been very special because I'm just sharing just very vulnerably who I am today. And thank you for being here. Bye-bye.